Brothers and sisters, should Muslims be in the business of judging others, judging people? First and foremost, to think through this question together this afternoon, is judging people to begin with even avoidable, humanly possible to avoid and escape passing judgment? And reality it isn't. We all pass judgments and we all accept judgments being passed in more ways than we realize. We all are happy that there are product reviews out there to guide our purchasing decisions. We are all grateful to find out someone's true colors before we get stuck in a relationship or a partnership with them. We are all seeing it justified to warn against the criminal before others are harmed by him. So we all do this. We all assume the role of judge and jury, not just in the courts, but in, in the court of life, in day-to-day -day life, around the clock, 24-7, this happens. And this, in a sense, is not just unavoidable, but useful. You see, judging good from evil is built into our fitrah, built into our nature as human beings, as an automatic means of protecting ourselves and protecting those we care about. And the only thing remaining is how do we do this correctly? How do we do it right? And how do we not overdo it? Revelation came to show us how. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna anzalna ilayka al kitaba bil haqqi litahkuma bayna al nasi bima araka Allah. We have revealed the book to you with the truth, in truth, so that you may be able to judge between people through what Allah has shown you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, yes, not every issue is a moral issue. Some issues are just personal, personality types, personal preference, cultures, norms, that's fine. But when it comes to morality, Allah has revealed to us a flawless and priceless rule book for right from wrong, for morality. And what I mean by flawless is that Allah spares us through the revelation from being short-sighted. It's not just the evils that are crystal clear to us all are evil, do not murder, right? And it's not just the evils that are obvious and apparent because they immediately harm us, like murder. But there are so many evils out there whether an individual partakes in them or a society, that they're more subtle than that. They're like cancer. They go under the radar until many a times it is too late to be treated. So it is flawless in that it identifies for us all good and all evil, not just the apparently evil and the immediately harmful. That's flawless. And as for it being a priceless rule book, because there is no prosperity for the individual or the society without a way to measure these things. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Let there rise out of you, O recipients of this priceless book, a community that can call others to it. How can you call others to it if you can't identify it? Call others to it and enjoin the good and forbid the evil and these, only these, are the ones that are prosperous. And a society and an individual that does not do this is bound to be doomed. He even said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul, I swear by Allah, you will promote the good and you will prevent the evil or else Allah will cause harm, punishment, torment to descend upon you. In this world before the next, to descend upon you, ثُمَّ تَدْعُونَهُ فَلَا يُسْتَجَابُ لَكُمْ And then you will supplicate to him and he will not respond to you. But what, what the revelation also did after this is remind us of our limitations when passing judgment. Especially when passing judgment on human behavior, on human beings. Because the human being is not just one act. You don't reduce them to a single act. They are a combination of all of their actions. The human being is more nuanced, is more complex than to simply reduce them to a single act they perform. You see, the act of drinking wine is evil. 
But a person that drinks wine could even be addicted to wine or intoxicants, could have a lot of good in them. They just haven't broke free yet. So when it comes to human behavior, there are layers of limitations we have to keep in mind. The first of them is that we don't have the full picture when we're judging. In other words, we are judging based on the exterior and on the temporal, the temporary. We don't know what's going on on the inside, the inside story, and we know that anybody can be redeemed so long as there's a breath left in them. Because our tradition, our Prophet ﷺ taught us through the prophetic tradition so much. He taught us that a, a worshiper enters the fire because of a cat. That she starved until the cat died. And we are told on the other hand that there's a prostitute who is forgiven because of a dog. That she quenched their thirst, she gave them water. We don't know the full story. Even the Prophet ﷺ himself said, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ وَإِنَّكُمْ تَخْتَصِمُونَ إِلَيَّ فَأَحْكُمُ إِلَيْكُمْ أَوْ بَيْنَكُمْ عَلَى نَحْوِ مَا أَسْمَعْ وَلَعَلَّ بَعْضَكُمْ أَلْحَنَ بِحُجَّتِهِ مِنْ بَعْضٍ I'm just a human being. I, even him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm just a human being, and you bring me your disputes, and I judge between you based on what you said to me. And perhaps some of you are more articulate, are better at presenting their case. You're more just eloquent in your speech or better at designing a hit piece video or something, right? Just, some of you are better at presenting your case than others. So if I judge for you something that you know does not belong to you, my limitation, then do not take it because you would be taking your share from the hellfire. All I can judge is the exterior. Or even the hadith of Usama, the very famous hadith of Usama. If that is not enough of a warning against judging people's interiors. Usama, you know, was in the battle of Al-Huraqa and there was a man that was devastating the Muslims, dropping Muslims left and right with his sword. They finally chase him down, he trips, he falls. He says, La ilaha illallah and Usama says, I'm not falling for that and he kills him. He goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Hala an qalbi. How dare you do that? Did you open his heart? How could you do that? You think about it. Like The likelihood of this man being sincere, the likelihood of him not pretending just to save his skin, is very small. But yet, there was a protocol that had to be followed. You don't know. Even the Prophet ﷺ said, in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, that a man once said to his brother, Wallahi la yaghfirullahu lak. I swear Allah will not forgive you. You've done too much. And so Allah said, Man dha alladhi yata'alla alayhi. Who is this person swearing about me that I won't forgive? Who's adjudicating on my behalf? Who has that jurisdiction but me? He says, Qad ghafartu lahu wa ahbattu amalak. I have forgiven this person and I have forfeited all of your deeds for saying that. And so we, when we judge, we judge based on the exterior, we judge based on what's right in front of us temporarily in terms of the dunya, but we know that we don't have the full story. We don't designate for any single person a seat in paradise or the hellfire. The second component here, when, you, when we have to pass a judgment on someone, it's not doing it out of a, a place of gloating or relishing in the fact that they are misguided. That's not where it's coming from. It's coming from our devotion to Allah that we judge as He judges. We measure as He taught us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rights from wrongs, approval and disapproval. You know, like in the Quran we hear that Ibrahim alayhi salam was concerned for qawm lut of all people. The people of Lut, when the angels were on their way to destroy them, Allah says, يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ Lut." Ibrahim السلام, argues with us, just concerned for his fellow human being. Oh Allah, give them a little longer. Maybe they'll U-turn. Maybe they'll reform. Maybe. Allah Azza wa Jal even praised him for it. And he said, إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَحَلِيمٌ أَوَّاهُ مُنِيبٌ Ibrahim is Halim, is so forbearing. Like you think Ibrahim, after everything he's been through, he'd say it more than anybody, like good riddance. 
He's so forbearing. He still has room to be concerned for these people. And then Allah says he is awah. Awah means he's hurt by human suffering. He wishes it didn't have to be this way. And he is munib also. He comes back to Allah. And if the verdict is final, he resigns to the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should all be like this. It should come from a place of concern. Yes, I disapprove. Yes, I'm appalled by this or that. But I wish they could wipe their slates clean. I wish they can become better, turn a new leaf, out of mercy and concern for them. As the Prophet ﷺ said, خَابَ عَبْدٌ وَخَصِرْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي قَلْبِهِ رَحْمَةً لِلْبَشَرِ A person is doomed and they are a loser if Allah has not granted them any mercy in their heart for all of humanity, for all human beings regardless of where they rank in terms of moral judgments. And even Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam one time the entire night he's reciting one ayah and weeping through it in tu'adhibuhum fa innahum ibaduk. Oh Allah, if you punish them, they are your servants. I can't overrule you. You are the king, I'm the slave. But he's wishing it didn't happen, right? وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And if you are to forgive them, you are the mighty, you are the wise. It's not my place to object. But he wishes his dua for them would be accepted. So number one, you don't know the full story. Number two, it's from a place of concern. Number three, just because in Islam we are told, yes, judgment is inevitable, just do it right doesn't mean that's all you should be doing. Number three is you should be more concerned with yourself and your flaws than anyone else. It's not like you're flawless. You are judging as a slave would judge by the ruler and the metric of his master. You are not the master. You are not the Lord. You are the impoverished slave that is anxious about his sins and more preoccupied with them than the sins of others. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a beautiful hadith, يُبْصِرُ أَحَدُكُمُ الْقَذَاتَ فِي عَيْنِ أَخِيهِ وَلَا يُبْصِرُ الْجِذْعَ فِي عَيْنِ نَفْسِ Some of you can see the, the speck of dust in the eye of their brother and they don't notice the tree trunk in their own eye. This is an inverted perspective, a destructive one. An unacceptable mentality. You know they say don't be judgmental. The mentality of judging, obsessed with judging, utterly un-Islamic. Even Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, Muhammad ibn Sirin, the famous tabi'i, he heard a man cursing al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj was a brutal tyrant. He was a murderer. But the man was just like going off at him. Like, you know, the way people just love to sit back and just rail on politicians all day, all night. We're not justifying what a politician is doing, but this is not what you spend your time doing either. So Ibn Sirin said to him, listen, stop it already. Because when you meet Allah, the least of your sins will be heavier on you than the greatest of his sins. It's not going to matter to you what he does when you meet Allah. All that's going to matter is what you've done, even if it's so much less than him. And so we don't know the full story and we are concerned with our brothers and sisters in humanity and we are more concerned with our own indiscretions and crimes than those of others. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله. The fourth guardrail or qualifier when it comes to this issue of passing judgments on people's behavior is that Islamically we are not permitted to probe and investigate when there is no warranting of that. It is not open-ended. In other words, we don't seek out people's mistakes. No witch hunts. Whether it involves spying or not, you just don't do that. And if it comes your way, and you are obligated to investigate, then be very careful about verifying. Sometimes there are people that, whose testimony you think is reliable that you will regret gravely. You know, Umar radiallahu anh, has that famous incident where he asked the man, I don't know, you bring me someone who knows you. And then he brought him a guy 
And so he asked this guy who's vouching for him, you know him? He said, yes, I know him. He said, have you traveled with him? He said, no. He said, are you his neighbor? He said, no. He said, have you dealt with him with, in finances, money? He said, no. Because that's how you know someone. You, know, you see them where they come in and where they go out late night. Or you deal with them in money where people's true colors come out. right? Or you travel with them because you can't fake it forever. So that's where you know someone. He said to him, no, at all three. So Umar said to him, do you know him from the masjid and you see him praying and always bobbing his head in recitation? He's always in the rhythm of tilawa. He said, yes. He said, go away, you don't know him. You're assuming he's reliable and vouching for his reliability when you have not sort of reached the threshold of acquaintance with him to actually tell me that. So many people you may think are reliable, are relaying to information. You may think have a solid integrity and religious commitment, and they don't. And sometimes you even want to second guess yourself. Sometimes our sense of justice, which is a beautiful thing, can get us to be hasty. You know, Imam al-Sha'bi, rahimahullah, he says, I was one time with uh, al-Qadi Shuraih. Shuraih was the Qadi, like the grand judge, the chief justice, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab. He said, and I was there, and a woman came, and she's complaining to her of some man oppressing her, and she's crying and crying and crying. He said, so I leaned over to the Qadi, and I said to him, it's very obvious, she's been through a lot. This woman has really been wronged. And so the Qadi turned to me, Shuraih al-Qadi rahimahullah, and said to me, the brothers of Yusuf, ja'u abahum isha'an yabkun. They came to their father at night crying. Don't be so quick to judge in someone's favor in the spirit of justice the moment you see some tears. Stay anchored, hold on. Don't be hasty. And so verification is very important. If you have to judge, verify carefully. And the fifth and final point is when you do verify and it turns out to be guilty as charged, that does not mean you necessarily have to retaliate. It does not mean you publicly shame. It was even the preference of the Prophet ﷺ to say, ما بال أقوام يقولون أو يفعلون كذا وكذا. What is the matter with people that they say X and Y and Z without naming them out? You know the call out culture and just naming people and shaming people and canceling people. Because this of what this does is it gives people people an easier road to redemption. They are not sort of labeled and stamped indefinitely. And that's what ultimately you want. You don't generalize, say, oh, they've been faking it the whole time. Or you don't say, oh, all people are like this. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever says that is the most doomed out of them. Whoever says all the people are doomed, he is the most doomed out of them. And he is the one that doomed them. When you just conclusively pass this verdict on them, broad brush. And there's one incident that I will close with quickly that pulls all of this together beautifully. Abu Nu'aym, uh, Rahimahullah, he narrates from Abu Qulaba that Abu Darda radiallahu an, the famous Sahabi, one time passed by a group of people that, was, that were cursing at a man because of some sins he was committing. And so he said to them, La tasubbu akhakum. He said to them, If you found him in a well, if he fell deep into a well of water, weren't you going to pull him out? Say, Yeah, of course we would pull him out. He said, فَلَا تَسُبُّ أَخَاكُمْ وَحْمَدُ اللَّهَ الَّذِي عَفَاكُمْ Then stop cursing at your brother. You're keeping him down like this. Stop cursing at your brother and just praise your Lord who spared you. That could have been you. Actually, it could be you tomorrow. Praise your Lord who spared you for now. So they said to him, أَفَلَا تُبْغِضُهُ Don't you hate him? Like, don't you hate the sinner? You know, hate the sin, not the sinner idea. We will not fully be able to separate between sin and sinner, but they are not exactly the same either. How we feel about the sin, we want it destroyed, is not how we feel about the sinner. We want them saved. So they said to him, Afala tubhiduhu, don't you hate him? He said, Innama abhadu amalahu, fa in tarakahu fahua achi. What I really, really hate is his sin. That's actually where my hate is targeted even if he happens to be in the way, right? What I really hate is the sin. And if he gives it up, he returns to being my full brother. May Allah Azza wa Jal use us for the betterment of ourselves and the people around us. 
May Allah open up for us the doors of imparting khayr upon ourselves and our loved ones and everyone within reach, Allahumma ameen. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us minds to understand the revelation He granted us and give us hearts to accommodate the virtues He expects of us. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive every Muslim everywhere and cure every sick Muslim everywhere. And may Allah Azza wa Jal spare and relieve and alleviate the pains of everyone suffering everywhere. Allahumma ameen.